seven miles from Sydney and a thousand miles from Care, the Port Jackson and Manly Steamship Company ferry tokens. I am Quentin Christensen, a collector of said tokens. Before the tokens, let's step back and look at the history and the place. The early days. The first fleet left England in May 1787 and eight months later arrived in Botany Bay. On the world map we can see just how far that journey was and how relatively isolated Australia is. The destination was Sydney on the east coast of Australia, the capital of what is now the state of New South Wales. When the first fleet arrived, Botany Bay, just below Sydney itself, wasn't as suitable as hoped, so they headed north. On the 26th of January 1788 they entered Port Jackson, now more often called Sydney Harbour. There they found, as Governor Philip recorded, quote, one of the finest harbours in the world in which a thousand sail of the line might ride in perfect security. The site of the original colony was Sydney Cove, on the south shore. This is near where Sydney Harbour Bridge stands today. Sydney itself has since developed around the harbour, a sheltered waterway which covers an area of 55 square kilometres with a perimeter of 317 kilometres. Early Ferries In 1789, the Australian shipbuilding industry was born to maintain communications with the far-flung outpost of Parramatta, 24 kilometres upriver, a sailing hoy was built. Known as the Lump, or the Rose Hill Packet, observers described it as crude. Still, it must have been effective, as it worked the river until around 1800. Although no pictures exist of Australia's first ferry, this is an 18th century diagram of a similar type of hoy. Other small boats appeared within a few years, charging a shilling for each passenger or hundredweight, which is 50 kilos or 110 pound of goods. The first steamship to arrive in Australia was the Sophia Jane, arriving from England on 31st of March 1831, just ahead of the first locally built steamer, Surprise. The Surprise was a 25-ton ferry built by Henry Gilbert Smith a merchant who came from Northamptonshire, England, in 1827. We'll hear more about him shortly. Manly. When the First Fleet arrived, Governor Philip was impressed by, quote, the confidence and manly behaviour, end quote, of a group of Aboriginal people in the northern reaches of the harbour. As such, they called the place Manly Cove. A ferry was going to be crucial for development of Manly. By ferry, Manly is just 7 miles, a little over 11 kilometres, from Sydney Cove. As the Port Jackson and Manly Steamship Company later put it in their holiday advertising, 7 miles from Sydney and 1,000 miles from Care. Without the ferry, in the early days, Manly was a 112 kilometre trip by rough bush track around Narrabeen, Hunters Hill, Lane Cove and Parramatta. As a result, before the ferry, in 1848, only 12 families lived at Manly. So what is at Manly? Manly is a sandy isthmus between Sydney Harbour and the sea. A beautiful natural area with picturesque surfing beaches and a sheltered cove. However, to get to that sheltered cove, a ferry has to cross between the heads, over a mile of essentially open sea and taking those waves side on. Given the conditions they face, Manly ferries need to be tough. Some ferries destined for Manly have been built in Europe and then made the journey to Australia under their own power. I mentioned Henry Gilbert Smith earlier in connection with the Surprise Ferry. Henry held a number of prominent positions in the colony. These included Chairman of the Commercial Banking Co. of Sydney, Government Director of the Sydney Railway Company, and Member of the Legislative Council, the Upper House of Parliament. He built a residence in Manly and was struck by the prospects of Manly as a seaside resort. Smith built cottages, a hotel, church, school, gardens and baths. 
He had much to do with planting the iconic Norfolk Island pines on the ocean front. Most importantly, to get there, Smith built a wharf for the ferries in 1855. Manly Ferries Smith chartered the Brothers, a 24-ton wooden paddle steamer as the first permanent Manly Ferry. A fare originally cost threepence return. Another early ferry was the Phantom, which arrived in 1858. Her dark green hull and long white funnel topped with a black band was a colour scheme which persisted for over a hundred years. A period of intense price competition in the late 1800s ensued. This saw passenger numbers increase substantially and numerous companies collapse or merge. An example of particular interest was a real estate promotion. If you bought a lot in Manly and had one of the contractor's houses erected on it, you got a metal ferry pass good for life or a set number of years. These passes were engraved with your name and the pass number. Soon after, metal season ticket passes were issued for terms such as yearly, three or six monthly. In 1907, the Port Jackson and Manly Steamship Company Limited was incorporated, having amalgamated basically all of the smaller companies. The forming, renaming and merging of companies meant that by the 1960s, the Port Jackson and Manly Steamship Company held the ferry rights of some 16 companies. Early Passes The main listing of Manly Ferry Passes is in Kenneth E. Smith's Catalogue of World Transportation Tokens and Passes Except North America. The details I have collated are all counted from the 1981 edition. This includes early passes from companies which later merged into the Port Jackson and Manly Steamship Company. There are two passes from the Port Jackson Steamship Company, which was formed in 1877, and 18 quarterly and half-yearly passes issued by the Port Jackson Co-op Steamship Company between 1895 and 1901. These are all listed as rarity 9 or 10, with between 1 and, at most, 3 passes known of each type. Later passes have PJ and MSS Co. and a pass number. Each pass had a ring or hole at the top to attach to a keychain. What makes them particularly interesting is that each issue is differently shaped and in many cases coloured with enamel. This made it faster for the conductor to easily identify season pass holders when boarding or disembarking the ferry. From 1907 to 1956, at least 195 styles of passes were issued. PJ and MSS Co. issued men's passes in brass with gold plating. Ladies' passes are silver plated. Sometimes the ladies' pass had an L stamped through it. Teenage apprentices received a copper pass with gunmetal plating, sometimes with an A stamped through it. High school students also used the apprentice passes. Elementary or primary school children received a discounted pass. Usually this was unplated copper and sometimes with a C stamped through it. As there were very few children regularly travelling, there were often only 10 to 20 passes made. Once children's patronage was low enough, fares changed to a monthly cardboard pass. In 1928, the new ferry Curl Curl named after a suburb just north of Manly, was the fastest ferry in the harbour. She could do the Manly run in 22 minutes. That is comparable to the modern service you can go on today. In the image, she is flying the red and white Port Jackson and Manly Steamship Company flag. The most famous Manly ferry was the 1938-built South Stein, the largest passenger ferry in the world at the time, at 220 feet or 67 metres long and displacing 1,200 ton. She cost over £140,000 and worked until 1974. Pictured here with the 1970-built DY2 hydrofoil. 
Most of the manly service today is provided by freshwater class ferries. Four were built in the 1980s, and the first one has recently been retired. They are just starting to be replaced by new, smaller, emerald class ferries. Later passes. Coming back to the season tickets, and interestingly collectors of transit tokens played a part in the design of the ferry passes. Part of the cost of each seasonal ticket was a deposit, which was refunded to the passenger when the pass was turned in after it expired. With almost all the passes returned, the company would store them for use again 8 to 12 years later. The September 1953 edition of Fairbox by the American Vectorist Association included some Port Jackson and Manly Steamship Company passes in Ken Smith's Foreign Token Supplement list. Copies of this list circulated in Australia and collectors started acquiring passes from their ferry riding friends. With passes not being returned and no longer able to be stored and reused, new passes were dated. The first of these was the October to December 1956 pass. Once passes started being dated, the earlier undated passes in storage were destroyed. As a result, many of these are quite rare today. The metal passes were mostly made by Amor Proprietary Limited of Marshall Street, Surrey Hills in Sydney. Most either have a blank reverse or the maker's name, and in some cases the pass number is on the reverse. Between 1956 and 1973, a further 201 dated pass designs are known. From as early as 1947, at least six different designs of round metal single trip or turnstile passes were also issued. These are more common. Sydney Harbour Ferries Other companies ran ferries elsewhere in Sydney Harbour. Pictured are passes from two early companies, the Parramatta River Steam Company and the Balmain New Ferry Company. Similar to what happened in Manly, many of these companies merged into what became Sydney Harbour Ferries Limited. SHF passes incorporated similar design elements to the Port Jackson and Manly Steamship passes. They were also originally undated, but were outed to collectors by the same edition of Fairbox. Sydney Harbour Ferries was reportedly very upset at the Fairbox article and its impact on their passes. They appear to have been even more thorough at destroying the old passes. Smith lists 32 pre-Sydney Harbour Ferry tokens, 67 undated Sydney Harbour Ferry passes, and 119 dated passes, all in different shapes like the Manly pieces. Also similar to Manly, there are six round single-use turnstile designs. Today. The railways didn't have as much impact on the Manly service as other routes in Sydney Harbour. Once the Sydney Harbour Bridge opened in 1932, ferry patronage gradually dropped. With the opening of the Spit Bridge in 1958 and increasing car ownership, drivers had an almost direct route by road to Manly. Google estimates the 14.7 kilometre trip by car should take around 26 minutes. As of June 1973, metal passes were discontinued entirely and replaced with cardboard passes. The New South Wales Government took over both the Port Jackson and Manly Steamship Company and Sydney Harbour Ferries on December 1, 1974. Today, the Opal Smart Card is used to pay for travel on the ferries and other public transport in Sydney. Conclusion the days of token passes on the Manly Ferry might be over, but collecting them keeps the history and atmosphere alive. There are several great books on the subject which helped with my research, particularly Manly Ferries of Sydney Harbour by Tom Mead and The Ferries of Sydney by Graham Andrews. These contain lots of stories about the ships themselves and the characters who crewed them, which I didn't have time for today. On screen, I've also listed some websites which helped with my research. The ferry continues, so do take a ride on it if you find yourself in Sydney. Thank you for watching, and thanks to Mr. Salgado for the invitation.